This morning we'll talk about psychological entropy. You will remember from time to time we speak of entropy, the physical law of entropy. And in this work, our goal is to bring the wisdom of the East together with the science of the West. That was Gurdjieff's main thrust of this system when he brought it to the West, because he saw that the world was in need of something and that if it didn't get it, it wasn't going to benefit. It was going to continue on a decreasing octave. And so in this work, we attempt to join the wisdom of the East and the science of the West. But we don't try to do it in an outer way. This is not a political movement. This is not something that we try to get other people to do, make other people do. This is something that we try to do inside of ourselves. We try and join the wisdom of the East with the science of the West inside of ourselves. And this is where entropy comes in. We've spoken about entropy and how it increases in any interchange of energy between two things. What I was going to draw on this board was a kettle of hot water. So just see the steam coming off of that and the little heat rays coming off of that. They can be in red. And over here, a cold kettle right next to it. And that cold kettle is blue and you can see it kind of, no, there's no steam coming off of that, just these little shiver marks coming off of that. And you set them next to each other, there's an exchange of energy. The hot and the cold begin to affect one another. But the way they affect one another is the energy goes back and forth until finally they are both at room temperature and there's no longer an exchange of energy. And that's when they have reached maximum entropy. So all of the energy that can be exchanged has been exchanged. They're flat. They're equal. They're the same. Nothing is happening. This is the way I want you to think about it. Nothing is happening here. Entropy may also be looked at in a psychological way. Let's take an example, a metal clock. Little metal wheels and cogs in there, little metal parts. And they're all arranged and organized in such a way that as they move, they move the second hand of the clock and the minute hand of the clock and the hour hand of the clock, and so it keeps time. And there's a little adjustment in there. If it's too fast, then you move it this way. If it's too slow, then you move it that way so that it keeps proper time. So we have some organization there, would you say? Quite a bit of organization. If we take that metal clock, which we have to say has some order to it, and we heat it up a couple thousand degrees so that the metal melts, it passes from order to relative disorder, to just a mass of molecules that can't keep time, that don't do anything really except just bounce around like molecules do. If you litter your desk, just allow papers, mail, and notes, and things to accumulate. You see that your desk begins to pass into disorder. And very shortly, if that happens, you begin to pass mentally into disorder until you finally get into a muddle around your desk. You get around your desk and it's like, uh, where was this? Where was that? And it's a muddle. So you've passed from some order to disorder. The reason I'm using these examples is because I want you to see entropy as a psychological thing, not just as a physical thing. If you don't arrange your thoughts through effort, they become disorderly, increasing entropy. People who just allow their minds to drift, float, they allow themselves to think by association, they don't direct attention. There's not much order there. What time is it? Where? You know, right here. What? What time is it? When? Right now. Where? Right here. It's just by association, so there's no directed attention. Nothing is really happening. So there's an increase in disorder, and obviously there's an increase in entropy. So there's no real exchange going on. Why is there no exchange going on? Well, there's nothing to exchange. You have no hot, you have no cold. Everything's just tepid room temperature. Kind of reminds you of the Bible thing, doesn't it? Be hot or cold. If you're not hot or cold, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Interesting. If we never say, what does this mean? If we never say to ourselves, what do I really think about this? What does this situation really mean? How do I really feel about this? Then we increase disorder and entropy in our inner world. We just go with whatever comes. What do you think about that? Well, I think blah, 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 blah. Well, do you really think that? Well, yeah, I, don't, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think about it that much. You see how entropy has increased, disorder has increased. How could you possibly know what you think if you never apply yourself to it? Well, I think this. Really? Where did you get that thought? Well, that's what my father thought. That's what my mother thought. That's what everybody at school thought. That's what they taught me. That's what I learned. So that's all acquired. So what do you think? I think whatever I've acquired. That's not very orderly. So entropy is increased. Psychological entropy. Life has a degree of order. When I say life, I mean living things. So life, this organic film on this planet, has a degree of order. 
And it's sometimes it's a very high degree of order. If you'll look at the helix of DNA, little strands of DNA, it's pretty amazing the order involved in that. It's also pretty amazing how long it took us to find it. In the West, we couldn't admit that it was there until we could see it with a microscope. In the East, they knew it was there. And they knew that eventually some dummy would find it with a microscope. He'd trip over it someday, which is, of course, exactly what happened. But in the East, they decided to use it anyway, even though some dummy hadn't tripped over it yet. If you'll think of DNA strands. All the DNA in your body, it's in these strands and all coiled up. If it were stretched out, it would be hundreds of thousands of miles long. Did you know that? It's really fascinating when you think about it. And that's all in your cells, in each of your cells. 30 trillion cells with all this DNA wound up in there that determines so many things about who you are, about what you are, about what you'll do, about how you'll react to things. Interesting to think about that, isn't it? That will definitely decrease entropy in you. So life has this degree of order that we see in the complexity of DNA compared with unorganized matter, like stones and dirt, chunk of metal. Relatively, there's no order there, or there's not as much order there. If you do everything that pleases you, whatever you feel like doing, you become more or less hard to please. Well, by the blank looks on your faces, let me give it to you another way. If you give a child everything it wants, does the child become more or less hard to please? Harder. So it becomes harder to please? Yeah. Why is that? So you don't know. Okay, well, just say, I don't know. I don't know. And if you want to guess, say, well, I don't know, but I'll take a guess. Make your mind a little more orderly. That's all I'm asking. So I ask a question, where well, was the order in that? Everybody just started guessing. Do you see what I mean? But if we're going to bring some order into this, then we'll say, okay, well, I require more of you than that. I require more than just a guess and more than an outburst or an ejaculation of your guess. I require from you that you wait to be acknowledged and that you say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'd like to take a guess. Do you see how automatically that brings more order? And do you see how automatically you don't want to play? Well, if that's the way he's going to do it, the hell with him. I'm not going to, he's not going to tell me what to do. I'm not raising my hand. I'm not in school. What do you mean, wait to be acknowledged? Who does he think he is? That's not directed attention. Can you see that that's all reaction? Yes. That's all mechanical? There's no conscious thought involved in that. That's just what happens when you are told what to do, and you don't like being told what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Does he have any idea who he's talking to? <laughs> who does he think he is? Now, I know that none of those thoughts would ever arise in your minds. I'm talking about the other people out there. <laughs> the ones who are not on this path, the ones who are not making effort to discover their essential self and to put to rest and to make passive this mechanical man that blurts things out and acts as if it knows everything when really it knows next to nothing. Effort tends to decrease entropy, giving more energy for you to use in other areas. And what's a good example of that? Effort decreasing entropy. Well, the effort to think. You know, he doesn't like it when I just blurt things out. And it really does make things disorderly in here. Everybody talking at once, it doesn't really make for clarity and order. We could take a handful of nails and throw them on the floor, and there's some order there. But you would have to make an effort to find out what it was. Oh, there are this many that are going this way, and this many that are going this way, and this. You could set them in that the point, each point, was pointing in some, at some compass point. So you could make an order that way, but you would have to bring the order to it, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You would have to make effort to do that. So there's one example. But we have this resistance to effort. Living as you wish increases psychological entropy. If you increase entropy, you increase sleep. When there's nothing going on, when there's no exchange, you're asleep. When you go to bed at night and you lie down and you can't sleep, why is that? If you can't sleep when you go to bed at night, try to understand what I'm saying. Why is that, Jess? There's too many ideas exchanging. That's right. You have too many thoughts bouncing around in your head and you're trying to figure something out. You're trying to work something out. Or worse, you can't stop it. You're not directing it. It's directing you. Which leads us to sleep, really. Only in this sleep, you can't stop that. Finally, we let everything go. We never take in new impressions. And then we sort of drift in the stream of life. And some people make this a goal in life, to just go with the flow. Why? Well, it's the easiest thing to do.
There's a difference between non-resistance and death. Death is the ultimate non-resistance, if you think about it. When you're dead, there's no exchange of any energy. It's all. That's it. It's over. And of course, I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about the death that people reach long before they ever reach the cessation of bodily functions, the cessation of their heart beating, their brain doing what it's... I'm talking about that death, the death that everybody gets to automatically if they don't do something to stop it. They don't do something to turn it around. That drifting. All efforts require some sacrifice. Even if it's just sacrificing your innate desire to do nothing, laziness. Let's face it, you're sitting here wrapped in a nice blanket and you don't really want to play fire drill now, do you? Like we did in school. That would take effort, wouldn't it? There's an innate laziness in you. An object which is at rest would like to remain that way, <laughs> is the physical law. And so here you are, objects at rest, and you really like to remain that way. They go, into, don't, don't, don't pull a fire drill thing. No, don't have a stand up and do calisthenics. Let's not play musical chairs, even if I really like the music. Do you understand my point? We have this innate laziness. One of the things that we have to sacrifice, or we would have to sacrifice, is this laziness. Energy used in being lazy is forced into a new channel. By effort, it begins to lead to new impressions. So let's say that I force this energy to be lazy. It takes energy to be lazy. It takes energy to do nothing. And how you know that is, even somebody who does nothing still keeps eating. They still require breathing. They require eating. They require these things. They require food because it takes energy to do nothing. Oh, well, yeah, but it doesn't take as much energy as it does to work. Well, that may or may not be true. But I think if you would think about it, you would find that you can get awful tired doing nothing. And you can get a lot of energy doing something. So what's that about? Well, it's about entropy. It's about the use of energies. And it's about psychological as well as physical entropy. And that's what we're talking about. So once we force this energy that we're using and being lazy into new channels by effort, we get new impressions. The question is then, is entropy increased or decreased? Oh man, you ought to see your faces. I think it's decreased. So entropy is decreased. And why is that? Okay. And this is why we're talking about it. Because we don't know how to think about things. Thinking is not our strong suit. It's just not. Reacting is our strong suit. I'm hungry. Well, I go get food. So that's our strong suit. That's a reaction. There's not a lot of thought involved with, I'm hungry. Well, what do you want to eat? Well, I don't know. Let's go out to dinner. I don't feel like cooking. Okay, where do you want to go? What kind of food do you want? I don't know. What kind do you want? Well, Chinese food sounds good. Well, we had Chinese food last night. Oh, okay, then what do you want? Well, I don't know. What do you want to eat? Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like married couples? Does this sound like people who are dating? Does this sound like people who know each other? It does to me. This is what I hear with people. Or, well, I want Italian. Well, I don't really feel like Italian. Well, I want Italian. Well, I don't really feel like Italian. Well, you always get to choose. Fine, what do you want? Well, I don't know. And you're back to that again. <laughs> well, fine, then let's go to Italian. We're going to for Italian food unless you can think of something you want to do. Fine, have it your way then. <laughs> then yes? I'd like to take a guess at why um, it is decreased effort. Guess, go. As soon as, in here, as soon as I make an effort, to do something, then there's also resistance to that effort. Right. And so that causes friction. And right. so then there's going to, it's no longer equal. Enough. That's right. That's perfect. That's great. So there you have it. So it's really not difficult. None of this is difficult, but you've got to make the effort. She made the effort. You made the effort to say, I think it's decreasing. I think entropy is decreasing. Okay. Well, that's all the energy I've got for that. So let me sit here now and let somebody else pick up the ball from here. And so somebody else did. But do you see how little energy we actually have? Because we spend so much time in this state of maximal entropy, no energy exchange. We're not stirring anything up. We're not heating anything up. We're not chilling anything down. We're just letting it all equalize the state of drooling, the ultimate state for people. The ultimate state is the state of drool. Yes, it's decreased. So we're getting more available energy when we decrease entropy. Why? Because there is more energy. That's why. You're not using it on being lazy. You're using it on something else. It increases. How does that happen? It's magic. Just be grateful that it happens and use it. What you do mechanically is lost forever, the work says, and what you do consciously remains with you. Making effort is doing something more consciously. It will give you force. It will decrease entropy. 
doing something unconsciously is drooling. It's just letting it all go. Doing something consciously is making some effort, and Patty was right. It's making some effort, and it makes some friction, and that generates energy. Yes? I was thinking that the effort that we make increases the organization. Oh, absolutely. So it's like, it's just like the kitchen, you know? If, if we don't do anything in the kitchen, it just gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. Exactly. And if we make some effort and we clean up, we've increased the organization in the kitchen, and it's clean. And not only that, but you're happier being in there. It's amazing how many dirty things we avoid. I just can't deal with that now. What that means is I don't want to put forth the effort that it would take to organize this right now. It's easier to drool. It's easier to just go to another room. It's easier to go out to dinner. It's easier to do something else. The energy to be lazy. Going with yourself mechanically increases entropy and robs force from you because you're not living life. Your life is living you. How many times is your life living you? I met somebody the other day whose life was living them. It was making them walk here and walk there. It was making them say this and say that. It was making them do this and do that. It was very sad because it was a very unhappy life. And not only was it very unhappy, it was redundant. It just has been going around in the same circle for decades of just doing the same things over and over again, changing the names a little bit, but basically doing the same thing. That's very sad. When you consider what could be done if someone were willing to make the right kind of effort, what could be done if someone could find out what the right kind of effort was. When you're negative, say you're negative with somebody, pick anybody you like, I'll leave that up to you, because I know you have an example of someone you're negative with from time to time. Well, pick me. Pick me. Pick me. Oh, pick me. Be negative with me. It's easy to be negative with me. So go ahead, pick me. That's fine by me. When you're negative with someone and you make an effort not to identify, you sacrifice the negative energy. When you make that sacrifice, if at the same time you remember your aim in connection with the negative emotions that you're having, all that energy that would have gone into the negative emotion instead goes into the energy to keep your aim and the eyes that wish to grow. It goes into them instead. Something happens. Something very profound happens. You have more and you gain something. Whereas being negative, you get nothing. You see that? You get nothing at all because you have to keep being negative. What good is being negative if you can just like be negative and then you can't be negative anymore? You've got to keep being negative just like you've got to keep breathing and keep eating. And what does negative give you? How does it enhance you? How does it lift you? How does it make you grow in any way? What does it do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So it's gone because it's mechanical. But if you make conscious effort not to identify with your negative state about some person, if you remember your aim in connection with that conscious effort, that energy that usually goes into being negative then goes into, I'm remembering my aim, I'm remembering myself, and these eyes that want to grow are growing. That's pretty cool. The work doesn't start with sacrificing the animal side. And this is what makes it different from a lot of religions. One of the things makes it different from a lot of religions. A lot of religions start off with, you've got to sacrifice the animal side of your nature. Most religions, there's some sacrifice involved, some blood sacrifice involved. What does blood mean? Well, mostly blood means life. The life is in the blood. The Bible thing is, don't eat the blood because the life is in the blood. Shed the blood because the blood washes away the sin. Well, what does that mean? It means sacrifice washes away the loss of negativity. And then it takes that life and it puts it into something else that's beneficial, something that's conscious. Your desire to not identify with something negative, your desire to grow, your desire to remember your aim, your desire to wake up, your desire to be more, your desire to have more, your desire to reach something more in life than just going with it, living it, or not actually living it, but having it live you, having your life live you. So the work starts with energy that's brought by shock or effort. So rather than asking you to solve all of the beast's problems, I mean, let's face it, animalistically, we've got a lot of problems. If we behave like animals, and we do on this planet, and if you don't think we do, what do you think the war in Iraq is about? Or, or a war anywhere. I don't care where it is. Somewhere on this planet, there's war. Why? Well, because people are animals. There's a savage. I mean, what do people do in war? Well, what it gets right down to is 
choking the life out of another human being, bashing their head in with a rock, clawing their eyes out, somehow making them stop doing what you don't want them to do. That's what it really comes down to. It comes down to tooth and nail like a savage beast. And if you don't believe me, it's because you've never been in war. But when it gets right down to it, when all the weapons are taken away, what it's about is teeth and nails and fists. So we make weapons out of our body and try and destroy the other person because it's not over until that person can never get up again. That's pretty savage, would you agree? Fortunately, we've stopped eating our enemies. Well, most of us have. But then, of course, now we psychologically eat our enemies, don't we? We have this big negative feast where we dine on them. And that's all that is. All the being negative about someone is just a big negative feast where you're dining on them. Oh, I didn't think about it that way. <laughs> no, it's good to have a whole new slant to things, though. It decreases entropy to have a whole new slant on things, to think about things in a new way. We start with shock, with effort. We start with the thoughts, the feelings, the forms of identifying, imagination, negative emotions, internal considering, and all that stuff that I'm always on about over and over again. That's where we start with the work. We don't start with, okay, uh, well, you've got to stop drinking, stop overeating, stop all those stuff with the sex, stop all those, stop that. No, we don't start there. In this system, we start with the psychological, the internal. Why? Because if the psychological man changes, we begin to see how the animal in us must no longer be a savage beast, but a useful creature with whom we can live reasonably. And that's really what we've got to do with our bodies. We've got to make them useful creatures with whom we can live reasonably so that they're not constantly making demands. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Feed me right now. But you just ate. I don't care. Feed me right now. Like a brat child who has had everything at once. I mean, look at us. How many people are carrying weight we don't need to be carrying because we don't know how to live with this savage beast reasonably? Well, that would be everybody who is carrying weight that they don't need. I mean, I could understand if we were living in the wilderness and you had to have excess calories stored on your body because it would be a long time before you got to another McDonald's. <laughs> but we're driving cars now and they're on every corner. So it's not that way. We don't need all this luggage that we're carrying around. Oh, but just in case. <laughs> so we don't talk about that in the work much. I talk about it because it's a great example and it really steps on your corns. And once your corns are stepped on, you're listening. There's always a tender nerve behind the bullseye. And once I hit it, there's a little conscious shock goes off. Now, that doesn't mean you always know what to do with it. Sometimes you just get negative which is unfortunate. But there are times when you think. There are times when you do something with that opportunity and you make some real effort and you get something from it. So it makes it worthwhile for those who are willing to do the work. The first conscious shock gives increased energy, decreased entropy, transforming hydrogen 48 into hydrogen 24. These poor people with the podcast, some of them don't know what hydrogen 48 is and hydrogen 24 is. Hydrogen is the most elemental element in our universe. Food, for example, can come in different hydrogens. We've talked about this before in the table of hydrogens, and we're not going to go into that now. So let's just say that hydrogen 48 can be transformed into hydrogen 24, which is 30,000 times faster, 30,000 times more powerful, 30,000 times more understanding and subtle, finer than hydrogen 48. It's like you go to the gas station, you take your car to the gas station, and there are three nozzles at the pump. And one nozzle is for premium unleaded, the other nozzle is for mid-grade unleaded, and the other nozzle is for regular unleaded. The regular unleaded is the lowest octane, the next one is the middle octane, and the next one is the highest octane. You don't have to know well, what's the difference in the octanes? And what, well, how, how much faster is this going to make my car? You don't need to know all that stuff. Your car says it requires this. Well, then give it that. It requires this, but if you give it that, it'll really be happy. So it's like different foods, different fuels. But transformation is something we can do, something we have the ability and the power to do through conscious shock. Then, of course, hydrogen 24 can go to hydrogen 12, which is still higher and full of meaning, richer, more sensitive, more receptive to things that hydrogen 48 could not even receive. It would just go right over its head. We start sacrificing our pictures of ourselves. We start sacrificing imaginary I. All those pictures make up imaginary I. And, obviously, we start sacrificing false personality. We begin to sacrifice our virtues, our merits, to which we cling, becoming more and more identified. And, of course, they're all connected with those pictures, aren't they? 
Well, but I'm, I'm a very good person. I'm a very kind person. I'm a very generous person. I don't insult people. I don't say harsh things to people. I'm very kind and magnanimous and generous and loving and blah, 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 blah. And we believe this about ourselves because we've got these pictures and we're looking at them all the time and we will not acknowledge anything that contradicts that. In fact, when something contradicts that, we get it out of our life and then we put up a wall so that we can't ever see that again. That's just not true. We call that wall buffer. We don't grow the wall deliberately, intentionally right now, but it evolves over time by continually rejecting the contradiction and dwelling on the picture that we'd rather look at. It's like your favorite food. Lydia's favorite food is what, Lydia? Ice cream. Okay. So it's like your favorite food, ice cream. If your favorite food is ice cream and all you eat is your favorite food, you're going to be visiting the hospital soon because you're going to start to suffer from malnutrition and a lot of other problems. Or you're going to visit the dentist soon because your teeth are going to rot from all the bacteria and so on and so forth, even if you brush them all the time. So what I'm saying is if we eat our favorite food all the time, if we do what we want all the time, it's going to be very costly. But if we begin to bring order, what do I really want? I want something more from life. What do I really want? I want to grow. What do I really want? I don't want to just be a lump here. I want to do something with my life. Well, why don't you? I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Great. You need some knowledge. So we've got to sacrifice, first of all, all of those things that we're clinging to, those pictures, those false ideas of ourselves, the imaginary eye, the false personality. Self-pity rapidly increases entropy. Have you ever noticed that? You have more or less energy to work through self-pity. When you start feeling sorry for yourself, oh, it's awful, and they never give me, and I can't do it, and why is it that he has more than I have, and I've worked so hard, and life has just been so unfair to me? Well, you've really increased your energy to work, haven't you? No, not in the least. Not in the least. You don't have any more energy to work. You have less. What's increased is entropy. We must decrease entropy and free our energies that would go to self-merit, self-pity, and negative states. Free those energies to go somewhere else. Well, to go where? That's the question, isn't it? To go where? Well, where? Well, into the effort to remember yourself, for one thing. Into the effort to give yourself conscious shocks. Well, what is a conscious shock? Well, let's take a conscious shock in regard to a picture of yourself, of your own meritoriousness. Oh, nice word, meritoriousness. Of your own meritoriousness. A conscious shock would be, wait a second, you're a liar. Steve said this the other day. It was so funny standing in the kitchen. Some guy asked him a question at work and he started lying. And he said, it was lying. He could hear it. He could see it. He could feel it. The words were coming out of his mouth. And he stood back from that. So something else in him stood back from that one. It's lying. It's lying through its teeth. But he couldn't stop it. It just kept on lying. That is a conscious shock. Do you see how that's a conscious shock? You stop identifying with it. You can actually see it. You can't stop it because it's more powerful than you are. Because it's eaten for a whole lot longer than you have. That's why. And it got a lot bigger. You fed that for so long that it's huge now. And Steve likes big things. So it's really big. So big that he can't stop it. But every time that he has this conscious shock and this separation and sees it, the food that would have gone to that went to something else. And that will grow. And someday, if he makes enough effort, consistently enough, someday that will become stronger and be able to shut that liar down in a heartbeat. It's possible. It can happen. And you know it can happen because there are other areas where you have been able to do it. That's what we're talking about doing. We have to decrease entropy and free those energies that would go to self-merit, lying, self-pity, negative states, whatever it is. And then they go to something else. Don't we get much of our ordinary sense of I from suffering? Our ordinary sense of I, the sense of I that we live with, we get so much of our ordinary sense of I from suffering. Think about it. How long suffering we are. Think about all the things that people have done that oh, we just put up with on the freeway. You know, you let somebody out and then nine people come out. You know, you're in a line, you let somebody ahead of you, then everybody in this whole line, they all want to go ahead. And we suffer. Oh, God. People are so inconsiderate. Geez, don't they know that I. Oh, uh, we suffer so much. So much of. <laughs> so much of our ordinary sense of I is involved with that. Oh, I'm such a long-suffering person. You see how that involves our meritoriousness? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm such a martyr. Oh, I'm so this. Oh, I'm so that. Oh, the things I put up with. I'm such a good person. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is funny when we look at it that way. It's not so funny when we're doing it. Oh, how we've toiled. 
Oh, how we've suffered in silence. We never get appreciated. I never get appreciated. Everybody else gets appreciated, but I never do. It's, it's awful. And we sing many songs like these to ourselves, don't we? All day long, the music is going, and we're dancing to the tune. Oh, look what they've done to me now. Oh, how much I gave, and they didn't appreciate it. Oh, if they only knew. If I died tomorrow, boy, then they'd be sorry, wouldn't they? Oh, isn't that a great song? Come on, you got to admit, you've sung that song to yourself. When I'm dead, then you'll appreciate me. That's a good one. Yes, when I'm gone, though, or some you know, guy's thing is, yeah, when I kick your butt out and get two 20-year-olds in place here, then you'll be sorry. Yeah. <laughs> We've all got our different ways of doing it. But the bottom line is, it's all that suffering. <laughs> all the songs that we sing to ourselves. As psychological man changes, we open more rooms in our house. We move more easily inside of ourselves increasing energy and decreasing entropy. When you can move easily inside of yourself in a wide range, different places, higher and lower inside of yourself, you're more comfortable inside of yourself. You're more comfortable in your skin. You know what you think of people like that. You like to be around them. You get energy just being around them. Let me stand close to the heater here. <laughs> you know, it's nice, isn't it? Come over to my house, sit in the office with me sometime, and you can just sit there and no, 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 be at peace. It's just calming. And then sometimes when it's not, because you came over with something else going on. But if you pay any attention at all, you can get it. The hot kettle would give itself shocks, getting hotter and hotter while still giving off energy, if it could, wouldn't it? Kettle likes to be hot. What's it about? <laughs> this is my purpose, to be hot. Heat water. So it'd get hotter and hotter and give off all kinds of energy, if it could do it itself. But unfortunately, a kettle can't, but you can. That's the difference between you and a kettle of water. Well, that's one of the differences. There are a couple other differences. I mean, I'm thinking about the shape right now. I'm thinking about the shape right now. There's not a lot of differences. A lot of us do look like kettles, you know. Short. This is my handle. This is my spout. Yeah. Yeah, the kettle can't, but we can. By giving ourselves the right kinds of shocks at the right times, we reach entirely different levels of energy inside of ourselves. If you can continually give yourself these shocks, during the day. You will reach new levels in yourself. You will open up things in yourself that you never could see before. You'll see contradictions in you that will make you laugh hysterically. I mean, really. Sometimes I see contradictions in me that make me absolutely laugh hysterically. It's like, oh, look at that. It is really funny. How could that exist? But it does. And how it existed was buffers. But once you start to reach a new level, you look down over the partitions. You know, buffers are like these little partitions they put in offices now. Mm -hmm. There's a desk here and a desk here and a desk here, and there's just like this partition between them. But if you stand up on tiptoes and look over, you can see what's on the other side. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about reaching higher levels in ourselves so we can look over those partitions and see the contradictions and see the things that just don't line up. And that's why we keep them separate. And then we include them as part of ourself. And we become bigger. We become greater. There's more room in us. Mm -hmm. And then... We have an opportunity to choose. Well, would you like to be this or would you like to be this? Well, I'll take this every time. So I don't have to be the little tiny mealy mouth, mechanical, angry, <laughs> the little backbiting snot that lives in all of us, that we lie about. It doesn't live in me. I've overcome that. Yeah, right. <laughs> all you've done is send it to another room where you can't see it now so that it'll come out later. And if you really bring light to it, you'll see it. And if you see it, then you have a choice about it. What you don't know will hurt you. Mechanical man runs down early in life, becoming a long dead person. Think about it. Think about how quickly mechanical man runs down. He's got no reason to live. He's got his 12 pack. He's got his television program. He's got his football game. He's got dune buggy. He's got his whatever. He goes to work. He comes home. He does his job. He gets by with whatever he can get by with. And maybe he's a little excellent because he knows he'll get a raise. So he does a little bit more. But basically, what is that? It's someone who's long dead. Someone who's being mechanical is long dead. And unfortunately, that happens early to most of us. But it's not so with a man seeking to become conscious, deliberately choosing inner development, transformation in accord with some teaching. I don't care what teaching it is, but some teaching that comes from someone who's already done it. Someone who knows the way and someone who said, look, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, do this. Well, I know it's hard, but it works. What do you want? Do you want easy, lazy, lumpy? Or do you want something to change, transformation in you? And it's okay if you want to be dead. 
I'm not saying that everybody can transform. Everybody can't. Some people have to die. Some people have to, in fact, most people have to be mechanical because it leaves more opportunity for those of us who really want to get out, to get out. Why is that? <laughs> They're not eating this food. I want hydrogen 24, they want hydrogen 48. Fine, eat all the hydrogen 48 you want. I want hydrogen 24. That leaves more for me, more to transform into hydrogen 12. I want higher fuels so that I can do higher things because I want something more. If you're that person, this system could work for you, if you'll work for it. You light up and